Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening, Dennis Marcelino, is maybe a name that you're not as familiar with as you might be in the future. But Dennis was a member of many pop groups, singing groups in the 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, groups which you'll be familiar with. I'm going to have him name a few of them in a moment. And his journey tonight is a description of how, brought up in the Catholic Church, he searched about everything that was out there, and then in the end found the found Jesus Christ, and then his church, the Catholic Church, as the pinnacle of truth. And we'll talk about that this evening. Again, you're always an important part of the program, so I want you to pose your questions to Dennis later and your emails. So if you'd like to call us, be sure to do so at 1-800-221-9460, or you can email us at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Dennis, welcome to the Journey Home. My pleasure. We've uh, communicated a bunch of times. I know you've watched the program, and, but uh, part of the, the pop culture for a while there. What groups may, might the audience recognize? Uh, well, we dee 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 dee. <laughs> the Lion Sleeps Tonight, the Tokens, um, Sly and the Family Stone, the Alvin Bishop Group, and the Electric Flag and Rubicon. Now, were you one of the lead singers? Or you? Uh, yeah, actually, I was on some of them, yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. I mostly you? played sax, sax and in bass and background vocals. But your training was originally as an engineer, right? Right. But engineering, science, and music have a, have a tie, right? And that, that math connection? Um, well, they do now. <laughs> <laughs> they did it in my life. Um, yeah. Well, let's begin with the early part of your journey. To, we've got so much to cover tonight because in your own life, you've, you've kind of nipped and dabbed in so many things. But let's fill in a little bit of your background and share your early part of your spiritual journey with the audience. Okay. Uh, basically, I started out as a cradle Catholic and uh, did four sacraments, made it uh, through four sacraments. <laughs> and then, uh, then the, you know, the, the street kids kind of took over an appeal, and I joined up with um, uh, a young men's social group you know, uh, called the Titans. Uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't really a gang. In those days, gangs were much different. Yeah. Um, but I, I was pulled into that, and I was, I was really attracted by the glitter of the world and wanting to be successful. Um, and at first, that success took me into engineering. Uh, you know, money and prestige, those yeah. were the first lights at the end of the tunnel for me. Mm. And, um, but then after that, I got back into music. After two years of college and working a little bit in engineering, I got back into music. And music had always been a part of your life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and when I was younger, yeah, I always loved music, especially like the easy listening music of the early 50s and stuff. Um, and then rock and roll, too, uh, later on. But I started making a living at it, and just one thing led to another. Huh. And the, the hippie movement was starting up in San Francisco where I was living at the time, so the music scene was very big. And, and there was a, a thread within the hippie movement of uh, where they were questioning mm -hmm. everything. The, the philosophy was, there was actually a peer pressure if you, you had to know what Sri Aurobindo said or, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> Krishnamurti. And so I, that really fascinated me, so I wanted to uh, delve into that. And, and the peer pressure at the time helped, huh. you know, make that a reality. So you, you found yourself going into that group and in uh, uh, in pop music. Yeah, How right. long were you in pop music? So? Um, well, let's see. I started in 1967, and uh, I used to go to the Fillmore Auditorium all the time. Huh. And they had you know like the top you know three you know on on a Friday night you can see you know for 99 cents you can see Cream, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin. So I would go and see that, and I was just kind of fascinated by the light show and just pulled in by everything. So one time I was so overtaken by it that I went up to the stage when the electric flag was coming off, and I said, Buddy Miles was the drummer, and I grabbed him by the arm and I said, Hey, Buddy, do anybody looking for a great sax player? And he goes, Yeah, me. Be here at 12 tomorrow. <laughs> and that's how it started. <laughs> yes, that's how it started. Wow. What about your, your Christian faith during all this time? Was it put on hold? Or? Yeah. Um, see, uh, Christianity and pursuing the world uh, didn't go together, hmm. uh, especially you know, the peer pressure in, in the music industry. Yeah. Um, it's just like any other industry, really. It may seem uh, glamorous and all that, but it's just like any other industry, and there's things that you have to do and things that you, can't, that you should stay away from. Hmm. And so I fell into that. Now you mentioned that this particular branch of hippiedom that you were a part of was one that had a philosophical thread, a, a search. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a, a check out of society, but it was a search for truth, is that right? Right. Which took you in a lot of different angles. Right. Well, being in San Francisco at the time, um, I, you know, I, I got involved in some new age things and 
uh, like Guru Mar Maharaji. Mm -hmm. um, well, the way that that happened was, is first I took the, uh, the music business thread to the hilt. And I found myself very drunk one night at this job, and because uh, I was the only way I could cope. Because really, in my heart, in my heart of hearts, I did not want to be there. Mm -hmm. But my mind was taking me through this, and uh -huh. it says, "No, you have to be successful, and you have to do this, and money, and all that is where it's at." So I, I obeyed my mind and <laughs> went along for the ride. <laughs> and uh, but one night, uh, this bass player was getting ready to take over a position that I was in because I was moving on to another position, and he said to me, "He goes, uh, so what are you into?" And I was drunk at the time, and I said, I'm just into finding the truth. I don't care where I have to go. It just, just came out of me. He goes, oh, well, this is your lucky day. And, uh, and he says, give me a call if you want to know the truth. So uh, as soon as I got off work at 3 o'clock in the morning, I gave him a call. <laughs> and I, and he, um, he got me involved in this uh, with Gumaraji, uh, which was a group of people. And they didn't drink. They were very happy. They were searching for truth. They were searching for God, and they, they made it their pinnacle hmm. uh, effort in life. So, so that was good. It got me into, um, it got me out of uh, drinking. Uh, the music business became distant to me then. Um, it, it got me into meditating and looking inside and uh, taking growth and God seriously. But what happened at the end of that trail was um, a lot of the relationships and things in the group weren't working. The ma male-female relationships didn't, weren't working at all. Mm. Uh, and I was involved with this uh, woman, and she wanted to uh, move to Malibu to be near the guru. So I went down there, and, but she just wasn't happy. She just wasn't in peace like we were supposed to be. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was peace and love at the, at the guru meeting, but when we got home, it's like, keep the closet door shut all the time, you know. <laughs> then next week, it's keep it open all the time. <laughs> so finally, I, my, my cousin and his whole family were getting into Christianity. And they, uh, they invited me over one night, and I went over, and they said, so how's it going with Jane? And I said, oh, geez, she's just complaining all the time. You know, she's just nagging me all the time about this and that. Well, the, the wife got up and left the room, and I figured she was just kind of disgusted by my complaining. But then she came back into the room with a Bible, and she says, read this. So it was open to Proverbs, and so I looked in Proverbs, and it said, it is better to live on the edge of a roof than to live with a nagging woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just, that's what I did. I just started laughing. I, I said, why am I laughing so much for? I go, well, it's because it's true. At this point, I would rather be living on the edge of a roof. It would be nice and peaceful. <laughs> it may be outdoors, but it's peaceful. <coughs> so, um, so I started, we, me and Jane would get in our fights, and then I'd be out in the front, she'd be in the bedroom, and I'd be out in the front room with the Bible. And I'd just pick it up, and I was kind of like fuming, and I, oh man, wow, that's really good. And I'd, and I'd always come to a, a great page, and, and I just said, you know, I, I had rejected the Bible because the peer group I was in had rejected the Bible. Mm -hmm. But I, when I looked at it, you know, practically and objectively for what it was, as I, I go, wow, this is great wisdom. There, must, there might be more like that in here. So I just really, make a long story short, I got into their church. I started going three times a week. I uh, started going to Bible college. Uh, really got into the Bible. The Bible just became like the dearest thing in my mm. life to me. A, a deep conversion in the midst of that to Christ? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, be, well, my, my uh, relatives had been trying to get me to accept Jesus and I, go, I came from a New Age perspective and I said, oh I don't need Jesus, you know, I can go directly to God. You know, well then when you get this book and, and this incredible wisdom, that, I mean, I'd been into every form of psychology, philosophy, and I'd never run into anything that was just that succinct and that accurate in describing, you know, what we should do with our lives. So I loved it. We're going to talk later about how at the end of your journey, you also discovered not only Christ, but, but the Catholic Church. But at this point in that phase in your journey where you're going to Bible college, you're teaching, you've where was the, the church of your baptism, your birth, in your life at that point? Um, I had kind of discounted it, and I even had my phrases, you know, <laughs> I seem to say at this point. But I, mean, I guess we all do. We have, you know, anybody who doesn't come to the fullness of truth, they're using phrases to keep themselves from that truth, which is why I wrote my book, you know, because dealt, I've dealt with all those phrases. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, so I've come up with the answer. So I had my phrases, and even the, I'm sad to say, the, uh, the pastor of the church that I was going to um, uh -huh. said that Mother Teresa was going to hell. 
Yeah. And that's something I go, wait a minute, oh, time out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, that, that's a little too, I, I can't buy this now, I gotta start questioning this. It's amazing how bigotry can, can blind you to someone so good. Right, and they get and up in the pulpit, and I think they, they, have a, they have an act that they, you know, they develop an act. They develop a, um, a delivery, because that's what's popular, and, uh, and they, sometimes the act can override their sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It can, they can become comfortable in that role and in what they're saying. And even if they find themselves questioning from within, to break that image is difficult. I know that from my own perspective. Well, here you are, a committed Christian. Are you still in the music business? Uh, yeah, I just had a CD. Uh, oh, journey. no, no, I mean at the time of that, your journey at that point. Oh, yeah. Well, at that time, I was um, uh, touring with, uh, let's see, different bands. Mm. Um, and I did, had even made a... a Christian album with somebody, and but I got into the tokens and uh, started touring like with Jerry Lee Lewis and the coasters and those type of groups, you know, okay. uh, uh, oldies rock and roll tours. Were you struggling at all with your Christian faith, your commitment to Christ, and the in the music you were playing? Well, yeah, it, to some degree, I wasn't struggling with my faith. No, it's that was rock solid. Mm -hmm. I was totally committed to the Bible. The only problem is, is that there's peace in agreement. And uh, so everybody wants to be in agreement with each other when they're around each other. And if somebody says something contrary, mm. it breaks the peace, it breaks the feeling. So I was, I was in the business and I was not feeling comfortable with that. Mm. I knew there was some place else I had to go. But I guess like a lot of people in different jobs, you know, that was my job. Yeah, okay. Which is like that role, you know, again. Yeah, that's right. There's that role. You, you get yeah. comfortable in this and this don't make waves. Well, I don't know about comfortable, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what uh, opened your vision to the Catholic Church, your heart, to look back at the Catholic Church. Well, you, you know, I had gone through um, uh, a lot of different uh, things with the, with the Protestant Church, and I'm sure like uh, you're from, a, have a, some Presbyterian in your background. Yeah. Uh, you know, th there's like, you know, people are not just in agape, you know, and it's like, you know, hey, you know, that person's a five-point Calvinist, you know, yeah. or, you know or, or four-point, you know, it's just like, you know, yeah. even within, yeah. there's like a, um, so, so I, I wasn't really comfortable with that. But I didn't know anything more that I could do. Well, what happened was my mother had given my wife a, uh, a videotape of uh, St. Bernadette, the story of Bernadette. And, you know, it's I had- The movie? The movie, yeah. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah, it is. And it, it just shows you how times have changed. It won the Academy Award <laughs> yeah. for that year. Um, so I had, uh, when my wife would be watching it, I'd walk through the front room, and I, I wasn't watching it at all, but I'd walk through the front room, and I'd hear this beautiful music, you know, and I always, beauty still always tugged at my heart. I still w was mostly into easy listening. That was my love in music. So um, I, never, I never did watch it with her, but then finally the music got to me, and I wanted to watch it just to hear the music one time. So I watched it. And then the story was just beautiful, <laughs> just absolutely beautiful. Mary being an oasis yeah. for, um, for Bernadette mm -hmm. in her life. And I, and I says, that's it. That's, that's what God is to me. He's an oasis. But the only thing that, that's what's missing in the uh, Protestant religion that I was involved in was the beauty. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the beauty in that music. It's bombastic and, you know, it's a lot of self-glorification and vanity and, you know, concern, concerns that weren't really agape. Mm. to me. So that started me. And then I, then I remembered, then all, this is one good thing about being a cradle Catholic, you know, is that uh -huh. uh, all the images from when I was young came back to me. The beautiful churches, the, the stained glass, the dark wood, <coughs> the peace, the quiet, the reverence. All that was starting to come back to me. And I says, yeah, that's where my heart's really at. <coughs> well, at that time, of course, you've been not only a trained Protestant, a trained biblical Protestant, but uh, maybe a teacher Right, a teacher at a church where a very anti-Catholic pastor leads you. Right. So you're going to have to deal with, with all of that, and now the teachings of the Catholic Church. How was that in your journey at that okay. point? <laughs> well, like I said, the Bible was my friend. You know, it was my best friend actually. And at any time I had a question, it's like it wasn't. It didn't have to be me figuring it out anymore. By this point, I had proven that to myself that the Bible had 100% credibility. It never had shown me anything that turned out if I got into it, turned out to be false. So I, I started using it as the tech manual in my life, you know, to like, well, let's see, uh, how do you deal with anger? 
how do you deal with um, with marriage? And so I would do Bible studies. I loved doing Bible studies. You know, the Greek, the whole bit. Um, and uh, I, so I got into more and more studying the Bible. Well, s there are some things that I came up with that didn't quite you know, jive with what the pastor was saying. So here, here I was in a situation like I was in with the New Age and psychology and all that, thinking, well, what about, you know, that's the engineering side of me. You know, this doesn't seem quite right. So I had to deal with those whatabouts. Yeah. And I, I did my own Bible studies, and I came up with my closet Protestant conclusions, you know. I mean, I was in the Protestant church, but I had my closet conclusions that I, of course, <laughs> leaked out a little bit every once in a while to see, you know, if, that I wouldn't get any shocked reactions or, or somebody might agree with me, you know. And I found that all of those conclusions were actually in the catechism. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, there's, the, there's the credibility again. It's interesting because often the critique of the Catholic Church is, well, well, show me that in the Bible. You know, they'll pick some doctrine of the church. Show me that in the Bible. Show me that in the Bible. But in reality, in your case, it was actually through your study of Scripture that started drawing you the truths, truths which you saw in the Catholic Church itself. Mm -hmm. So how long ago was this journey, and when did you come in? And um, 1989 okay. is when I uh, finally became Catholic again. Did that have effect at that point on your musical career and what else you were doing? Um, well, see, music, I, I was still uh, touring with the Tokens and um, other groups. And See, I always had the, the secret wish in my heart, you know, I was growing towards something. Mm -hmm. Besides my own sanctification w w in whatever situation I was in, I was also tr growing towards what my work would be in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, by a process of elimination and just, if I'm going to be totally honest with my heart, which is the, one of the great reasons I got into personal mm -hmm. growth in the first place, was uh, I wanted to just witness for God in the world, which badly needed God. And I saw, here, here's the Bible with all these solutions to all the problems, you know. It's like I'd watch the news and I'd go, oh, please, don't you get it, you know. It's <laughs> like, you know, I got to tell you somehow. So I, I had to start writing, you know, and I had to start writing articles and books. And the first book I wrote in 1988 was called Sweeping It Under the Drug. And uh, <laughs> it's like I was trying to show that basically um, because they were saying we have such a drug problem, I go, here's the answer. Mm -hmm. See, you're not going to fix a drug problem without fixing a person's heart. Mm -hmm. Because once a person's heart is fixed, they're gonna, the drugs are going to be repulsive, actually. They're going to be too intense. Oh, yeah. But um, so there, therefore, I wanted to get that truth out. <clears throat> well, the theme that you chose this afternoon as we were talking was the seeing that after this long search of your life, at the end of it, after being committed and finding Christ, you saw and discovered his church. And for the church to call itself the pinnacle of truth, to, to many it sounds like an arrogant statement. Others outside, maybe in other Christian faiths, they would see that, you know, the audacity of the church to consider itself the pinnacle of truth. But what does the church mean? when it sees itself as the pinnacle of truth. Well, see, either it is or it isn't. Either that's a true statement or it isn't. It's, it's even like Jesus, you know, that's one of the things used as a, an apologetic for Jesus. You know, either he was, uh, you know, telling the truth or he was lying. Hmm. You know, well, it, it's the same thing with the church. Th that's, the, that's one of the main problems of the, um, uh, the whole Reformation thing, the Protestant break off. It's, it's like now there's many sources of truth. There are many people saying that same thing. And so what's a person out there to do? How, how can they tell? You know, because everybody is saying that they've yeah. got the truth. And uh, every commercial says it has the best product. You know, it, it's, right. we have so many Jaded. claims that in the end, truth is wa watered down to where it's hard to put a finger on it. And, and that's the draw to recognize in the church. Right. Well, well, you you know, I, I'm sure you've run across a lot of uh, people who have started out started out to disprove the Bible yeah. or the church, and they ended up converting. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you were talking about one the other just a couple of weeks ago, Cardinal Newman. You know? Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, that's uh, unfortunately that's what we all have to do. God is like a needle in a haystack. Truth is like a needle in a haystack in this world, because you know we're constantly being bombarded by. Um, the, like the secular church, for instance, you know, like that, that's why, I mean, one of the things I love to do is I, I just pretty much only watch EWTN now, <laughs> uh, but, and I love EWTN, it's been a great thing for me, but once in a while, I'll flick over to, and it's like a carnival of insanity, you know, coming <laughs> for something else, fast, maybe. it comes at you fast and hard, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like you have to judge the fruit there, too. 
the John Paul's opening statement in the Catechism, I think, says it well on this issue of the church and the church's responsibility towards truth. In his introduction, he says, guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. I mean, the ch this is the church recognizing its responsibility. It is not an arrogant thing. In fact, if it becomes an arrogant thing, it missed the truth. Right. Because the church is to be a humble servant of what is true. So why would the church think of anything else? Then the beauty is that we discover it to be true in our own lives. Now, some people might say, well, but I know the church has changed its mind in a few things over the years. Well, how can that be true if it is the pillar of truth? Now, how would you answer that question? Well, it's changed its mind not in anything basic. It's only changed, uh, you know, like some um, rituals and stuff like that, which just, you know, they find something better or more appropriate for the times to work, but not in basic, nothing basic. Yeah. And that is an important distinction, is that there, those levels of truth in the areas of faith and morals that the church has never ever seen uh, that it has the privilege of altering and that we have, must accept as the truth that the church has received through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There are other areas of discipline, as you mentioned, you know, eating fish on Friday or, or that kind of a discipline. The church has the freedom to change given the time and given the needs of the people. But what's important is that at any given time that the people of the church must trust the church, pe people of the church must trust the church as the authority and teacher. So that time, even those higher truths and the disciplines we are called to be obedient to because we trust the church's truth. And, th and that trust doesn't have to be blind. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like, like I said, I've, I've been, I was like a leave no stone unturned engineer. And I, uh -huh. I mean, I, 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 the questions will bug me. You know, if there's a what about to be asked, the what about will pop in my mind and I'm, I'll have to deal with it. Well, the church has come out 100% for me. So My guess is that there are some in the audience who have, let's say, children who've gone off into all those things like you have. Maybe even some of the audience have been there themselves. What's the draw? What was the draw in your life? And what is it that draws young people away into those other answers for life? <clears throat> well, um, I think it, it, there's, a, there's a combination of draw and pressure. Um, one of the, the pressures, I would say, would be to be in agreement with their friends, to be in agreement with the world. I mean, if it's on TV, it must be true, you know, that, that statement. <laughs> Uh, which now it's like it's uh -huh. just the opposite. Um, but people want to feel in step. They don't want to feel out of <coughs> step uh, with both their friends who are also tied to television. So I think that's, a, that's why EWTN is so important. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like this is a television-oriented society, mm -hmm. and uh, there needs to be a presence, a constant presence for the channel surfers mm -hmm. uh, to run into somebody who's speaking the truth and in love. So. A voice in the desert. Right. Uh, and music was also a thread through your entire life. Mm -hmm. When you look back, how was music, how do you see music as a, the, the way, one of the key ways that the Lord helped you on your spiritual journey? Well, music, you know, is one of those things that it, 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 can, it can hold the purity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can sit down with music and there's no peer pressure. Mm -hmm. if, if, I mean, when, you, when you've chosen the music. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a beauty there. Now, when I got into playing jazz, I, well, I played sax mainly. Uh, when I got into playing jazz, it's like I would, there'd be a, a thing where you'd have to solo. You know, it's not just play, play the melody or, or read the chart like in classical music, like, like, like when I came to in, before In that. jazz, you have a group of four or five people, they're all playing together, and then everybody has their turn. Okay, all right, Fred, you go with it. It'll well, mainly out. the sax player, it's like yeah. the sax player could play the head, this is the melody, now solo, okay, okay, <laughs> fine, that's fine. Um, what, what is soloing, you know? So, so I start soloing and um, trying to figure out how to do that. I do with, try to control it with my mind. Oh yeah, I want to be a great sax player. I want to be the fastest, I want to be. Then I hear back on tape and I go, Ugh, that sounds horrible. You know, the feeling isn't there. So it may, that's one of the things that primarily got me into investigating what I call inner space. Mm. Um, where was that music coming from? Mm. You know, was it going to spontaneously come out of me, or did I have to control it? It's the same way as like operating our bodies and our minds. Are we going to control everything we say, everything we do, or is there a, a place that we can tap into that can move us okay. to do something pure? And that's the Holy Spirit, and that's that's what dwelling within a body. Yeah, and, and, he's, and, and the Holy Spirit is always there. You know, to, I call it the truth meter, <laughs> saying you know, <laughs> regarding our actions, you know, or uh, or what I play, even you know. And I, want it, I just want it to always be like this. Yeah. So that's that truth meter, conscience, yeah. is always there in everybody, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. right. 
uh, not always formed. Not always looked at. Okay, not listened to, not right. looked at, not formed very well, can be blinded by the things that, you know, like Scripture says, a time where pretty soon people are calling what's good bad and what's bad good. Mm -hmm. We may have approached that in many ways in our culture. Uh, but music was one of the ways, and you're still very much involved in music. But you also wrote a book on science. Uh, why are we here? The scientific answer to this age-old question that you don't need to be a scientist to understand. Okay, well, how was science a big part of your spiritual journey, coming well, back to God? <clears throat> well, see, because I came up through engineering, science was the way that you proved things to be true or not. There was a method, a scientific method. So uh, I was trained to look at things that way, and I figured, well, why should that be any different about inner space, you know, about, or, and outer space, <laughs> you know? I mean, why, why, should it, why should we have to stop at theories, how far can we go in proving what's going on there? So, uh, so I asked those questions over the years, and in, in and out of every group, and I got to the point where I really understand what's going on in here and how it all works: the subconscious, the heart, where God comes in, and all that, uh, and the mind, and um, as well as outer space. You know, using that, and then all the all the space around us, all the what I call physicality as opposed to spirituality. Uh, you know, using everything within that to to prove is this truth or not? Okay. And it, it is there a God? And, yeah. and so your book uh, deals with those issues, reaching out to those that don't believe in God and maybe it can bring them closer. Yeah, it's written very conversationally. It's written very conversationally right. and simply because either if it's a truth, it can be said simply. It doesn't need to be uh, X equals blah blah blah. You know, it's it's either true or it isn't. Well, I know during the break uh, there'll be some information in case someone wants to find out more about your your book and, and your CDs, and you still are. Producing music, right? You're still involved yeah. with it? Maybe tell a little bit about some of the music you're still involved with. Um, oh, there it is now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. um, it, that's my new CD, and okay. I, I, I love it. You know, I, I finally, you know, when, whenever we do anything um, in creative uh, fields, we, we always have this peak in mind, this, this pure expression. And to me, th what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to get into beauty. I wanted to get back to beauty. I mean, I, I, I'm playing into a sunrise, a new beginning, a rainbow. You know, it's like yeah. beauty is missing from the music scene today. Although it was very popular when I was growing up, mostly uh, easy listening. Mm -hmm. And beauty, but beauty, God is love and, and beauty and peace. And uh, so I wanted to put out a CD that just, when the listener puts it on, they can get into that, that state. Because God is experiential and intellectual, so I wrote the book to cover the intellectual, and then I did the CD to cover the experience. To touch, touch the heart. Maybe if we have time later, you and I talked earlier about your whole experience through the last you know, 40 years of music and seeing how it's changed, and you know, maybe we can talk about that in a little bit. Oh. We're going to take a break now. We'll come back in just a moment with your questions for Dennis, again on the issue of the church, Catholic Church as the pinnacle of truth. Be with you in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest is Dennis Marcellino. He shared with us his journey of faith, uh, finding Jesus Christ after trying about everything else out, and then in seeking to follow truth and following Jesus Christ faithfully, he also discovered the Catholic Church, the church of your birth. Right. There's a sense in which, thank God for the seeds that were planted way back when. Amen. You know, we talk about being born again. Mm -hmm. that uh, as a, a new experience, we also recognize that scripturally that actually points back to that first of all sacraments in our life, mm -hmm. the sacrament of baptism where the Holy Spirit comes in, makes us a new creature. Okay, Let's take our first email, get you started. Are you ready to answer a few mm -hmm. questions? This comes from Jerome and Nina Kappas. Hello, thank you for your program. I love it. My question is, how do you help some, someone who is very science-oriented to come to faith? The problem seems to be believing in those, quote, things unseen. Thanks. Um, well, 
<clears throat> you know, uh, let me say, uh, there's two things I could say there. One is uh, things unseen. Um, anybody have a problem with atoms? Or nuclear physicists, aren't nuclear physicists supposed to be the epitome of uh, intelligence? Well, nobody knows that a, nuclear, a nucleus really exists. Nobody's ever seen one. Mm -hmm. But they don't call nuclear physicists believers, do they? Mm -hmm. See, So that, that's one thing. It's like we believe in a lot of things in the world that may not be true, but that just because the rest of the world accepts it. Uh, now, as far as things seen, well, we, we don't have to only see with our eyes. We could see with our heart. Mm -hmm. And so experience is something that you can see because you're experiencing it. And I, all of us are really interested in making our experience the best it can be in life. Mm -hmm. And so um, when, when you start delving in that direction, you'll find out that the Bible and the church has the best answers. Having been a scientist myself, who after leaving the faith for a number of years, came back to God, primarily through the study of science. It was my first journey back. I, my encouragement to the emailers, never give up on friends that seem so lost in their, their, their narrow focus on science because you just never know when because of something happening in their life or what's going on inside of them that they truly might be open to see something. I, through the study of the eye, the genetics of the eye, the Lord got my attention. You just never know. I know that probably in your own life, you never know when it's going to happen. So never give up on something. Never give up on prayer. And, and look for charitable opportunities. Drop a few hints uh, about just what he's talking about. You know, that why is it so hard to believe in the vertical when there are things in the horizontal in this world? I mean, who's ever seen love? Except as it's shown on the lives of people. Yeah, it's extremely important to us. Yeah, but we believe in love, you know, mm -hmm. because even though we've never seen it. Let's take our first caller. This is Maria from Wisconsin. Hello, Maria. What's oh, your hi. How question are you? for us tonight? Uh, thank you for uh, having my answer. My question, um, my, uh, my question to your guest is, uh, my kids um, are teenagers and they are getting into bands and they are using their money to buy their instruments. And little by little, they are getting into heavy metal uh, music. And um, they have been cradle Catholics. And um, since your, you uh, kind of related your life story, could you tell me how to, um, how to um, uh, direct these kids that are already uh, showing that music is going to be their lives, but the kind of music is not Christian. And, and yes, they have had my influence as a Catholic. I am a strong Catholic, but I can see that that is not enough. Thank you for your question, Maria. Okay, well, there's a few things to be said there. I think it needs to be recognized that, I mean, we have to accept that rock and roll is, is here, uh, not to stay. <laughs> I'm not going to finish with that song. Uh, and, um, and heavy metal and, and those kind of music. Why are they the most popular today? The reason why, I mean, the, the quick fix is um, that it, the world that is being handed to kids is just horrible mm -hmm. in the two most basic areas that they uh, have needs in. One of them is romance and the other one is inner peace. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they have all this energy and they're finding that music is a way to release that energy. Uh, so I would say that you need to help whoever you want to um, help see the, the true ways to inner peace and not be subjected to the world. And maybe as a gradient along the way, they could uh, start at least listen to CCM bands who are into that Christian, kind of, contemporary Christian bands. Right, um, th who are into that kind of music. Um, as a transition. As a transition, right. At least the words are going to be good, the thoughts are going to be good, the, uh, the experience isn't optimum, but it's a real expression of what that world is doing to them. Yeah. yeah that part of that is, is discerning your own children and your own environment, you know, and discerning whether pulling them right out of the music is an effective way or looking for the transition. And uh, as you and I talked about earlier, is recognizing the the negative influences that have grown so much in the popular music over the last 30, 40 years. I mean, it, maybe talk just a second about that transition you've seen in the music itself. Yeah, well, I think it's, it started out with the, with the absolute beauty of the uh, easy listening of the early 50s. And then when rock and roll came in, 
there's kind of a spirit of rebellion, a spirit of um, impulsiveness and addiction to freedom, like, you know, oh, we're free and we want to prove it now. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was is that first impulse, the, the, the addiction to freedom, started ruining romances. Mm -hmm. Boy-girl, very tender, wonderful things like boy-girl relationships uh, are also very delicate. It's like fine china, you know, they mm -hmm. drop and break very easily and it hurts. So then what came after that was kind of like a reaction mm -hmm. to, the, to the pain that was coming with that. But also, if you look over the time, there was a hardening starting to happen to love between men and women. And it got to the point of callousness. Now it's in complete anger, you know? Uh, and so that's unfortunate. But the, the only way to, to reverse that is you have to get back to the basics. Okay. And I think at this point in time, it's, you know, my first impulse was to go out and try to change the world. Yeah, I, I got into politics and um, I wanted to change it so that people, you know, especially kids, could grow up in a, in a safe environment. But I think what has to happen is because it's gotten so far out there, I think you have to just get a person to just change that, their world mm -hmm. from being that world to being the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And then it, within that, they find yeah, function. Change within in right. their heart. Let's take our next email. This is from Rob. Dear Marcus, I love your program. It is very interesting and educational in understanding the truth about the Catholic faith. My question, I have a very personal relationship with God based on the Bible. My interpretation of the Bible is closer to a traditional church's beliefs, such as the Catholic faith. I have visited almost every different type of church, but have yet to find a church that I agree with their same interpretations, which makes going to church very difficult. Why can't I enjoy my own spiritual love with God in privacy? I have even baptized myself, and I'm always trying to live my life in a very spiritual and Christian life. Uh huh. Uh, well, there's a couple of things there. One is God is calling, you know, the whole reason that God has done this is to unite free will beings together. So, yes, doing it on your own is important. You know, having that, maintaining that connection to God, both through his word and through his spirit, uh, is very important for you maintaining your purity because you're not going to find purity exactly uh, in other people around you because we're all impure to some degree. But uh, you do want to, you know, if you can see clearly, then you get involved. You know, get involved and and um, and try to help bring people up to the um, to the level of of purity that you experience within you, because that's what God wants. He wants us to be a family. He doesn't want us to be on our own. Okay, and a couple comments I'll add, Rob, to this. The and you and I talked about this earlier, Dennis. The, the problem of freedom. Uh, we live in a society that sees freedom as the ultimate. But in reality, an ultimate freedom is chaos. And so freedom is, in the truth of God, has its constrictions, all right? And, and we, it isn't just, I open this Bible and whatever I decide is right is right. Because you've noticed, as I read your, your email, that you've been visiting all kinds of churches, and you don't agree with every one of the things they say, but most of those churches believe that the Bible is the foundation of truth. So the question gets back to how do you know that you have interpreted the scriptures correctly? So you need to go back, how can I know what's true? And if you read the scriptures, as Dennis himself, in his own journey, he recognized that the scriptures itself points to Jesus establishing a church and his apostles, promising the Spirit would lead the apostles into all truth. And in the establishment of that, we see the church being led by the truth. And so we have a teacher in the truth. The, the importance of freedom, right? I mean, you, you talked about, about the the over abuse of freedom. But talk a little bit about the importance of freedom with bounds on it. Well, one thing I used to say in the, um, when I was uh, running for the Senate, uh, I said that, uh, you know, like, there's an addiction to freedom in the world because everybody wants to prove how free they are, uh, which, is, which is okay. Th that, that's, that's okay if, if it's true freedom that they're seeking, which they're a little confused about what that is. I say what the, what the church's approach to that is you put a fence up, and the fence says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Okay, now in there, inside of the fence, it seems like you're not free because you want to go and do what's outside of the fence. Hmm. But, I, but I found, is I found a lot of <laughs> heartache and just a trouble out there. What I say is that a, a fence that restricts us from doing freedom, uh, being free, also protects us from the wolves okay. out there. So really, there is a freedom inside of the fence, knowing that wolves aren't going to come, and you can relax. Okay. 
So that's true freedom. I mean, total freedom is an impossibility. I mean, we're not going to stop ourselves from dying. You know, and there's a number of things. So, um, so, tr so the, the highest degree of freedom that we can achieve is to accept and even the understanding the, the beauty of that freedom, not as a, as, a, um, as a constraining, but as wisdom and love and what's best for us and mm -hmm. trusting the church. And the danger of, of being your own pope, as John Henry Cardinal Newman said in one of his books, every church must have its pope. Well, you can be your own pope and decide for yourself. Well, the danger is, how do you know that what you're believing is true? And whether, in fact, it will lead you to an eternal relationship with Christ. I mean, that's the key. And I've learned through Scripture, it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Right. You see, we might think we're right. We might be wrong. And so we need a teacher, and that's Christ giving us the church. We, oh, I'm sorry. Well, why don't we go to our next uh, caller. This is Donna from California. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, my question is, if you're a cradle Catholic, and then you're, I mean, you, you're a cradle Catholic, and your parents take you to Mass every Sunday, but you don't really participate. I mean, you're just there because your parents actually force you to go. Then later on in life, as you get older, more mature, you want to come back into the Catholic faith. What would the process be of getting back into the Catholic faith? All right, you've been away. Now you want to come back. I get a lot of those emails from folk. Hmm. Well, our RCIA is a good way to start. Um, Which is, some of the audience may not know what RCIA stands for. Oh, it's just a, it's a series of classes that you do when you're coming. It usually begins in the fall, right? And it, Gives you the basics. Of that. Yeah, you just learn the basics. Another thing I would say is, is to learn that uh, the mass, I, I, how you approach the mass. Mm -hmm. You know, the mass is really a form of prayer. Um, you're coming, and don't let one word get by without without grasping its meaning. Uh, and that's fresh for me every week. Still, yeah. you know, and there's always something. Our focus gets taken away. Now, why do that? Okay, the reason why to do that is the experience. Well, every time I walk out of Mass, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling real good. And, you know, it, and that happens every time. And I like feeling good. So <laughs> um, that, that's uh, one possible motivation. But uh, as like a lot of things in life, you have to give yourself to them. It's like a spirit, religious disciplines. We end up in a, in a better, a more agape state, which feels better, feels more agape right. meaning Christian love. Right. Yeah. And... Uh, Bec but in order to do that, we may have to go through a little bit of a struggle because we're so revved up mm. uh, to live th at the speed of the world. Like I said, when you flip the channels, you can see what the, the rev of the world is. Mm. It's very high, very fast, very hard hitting. So sometimes in order, you have to stop that, and it's not a, the most comfortable thing in the world to do, to stop that. But once you do and you hit the peace, mm. then you say, Slow oh, down. I'm home again. You know, yeah. This is the best feeling. And sometimes people are, are drawn from coming back because they they feel guilty about being away so long, and they you know, they imagine there's not a, a confessional big enough for all that they have to confess, or or they feel embarrassed about that, or the roof's going to fall in. And, and the reality is, just as we have this picture on our set of the prodigal son coming back to the father, the arms of the church are always open, always welcoming back. Uh, go to your local priest. Go go to those in the church and and, and talk to those to get guidance back. It's, it's, it's an easy trip home. Mm -hmm. It's an easy trip home. All it takes is, is a turn to the heart. Let's take this next email. It comes from Mark. <clears throat> I am a cradle Catholic who left the church many years ago. I came back to faith by way of the Methodist Church. In the past few years, through a series of circumstances, I have been seriously thinking about returning to the Catholic faith. The thing that keeps me from coming back is my inability to distinguish between truth and what to me to me, appears to be legalism. Uh -huh. He struggles with the issue of truth and legalism. Well, um, uh, you have to see the, you know, the, the reasons for the, the supposed legalisms. But one thing you know, uh, that I, I wanted to say about the, uh, we haven't said yet about the Protestant uh, denominations, um, you have to recognize the roots mm -hmm. of what we're involved in. Okay, Jesus started a church. That church went on for 1,550 years. And then all of a sudden, Martin Luther did something that I, you or I would never do, uh -huh. and that is start up a movement against the church, the only church at the time. Since then, people have uh, broken off from Martin Luther and broken off from them. And, and so it's gotten into these many branches. And uh, everybody, when they're deciding on what church to get involved with, they all seem to have equal weight. 
Uh, and it's true, you do have to check them all out because every, there's going to be somebody in every denomination that's going to want to uh, say something to you to try to convince you uh, why you should be. So therefore, it, it's, it takes a little study. It takes, uh -huh. um, but it's well worth it. I mean, it's worth it to do the study and find out for yourself what the truth really the is. Things can seem like legalism if we don't understand why. Right. Or we don't trust the source and see the source as a loving source right. that, that wants the best for us and has 2,000 years of wisdom behind it. All right. I'll just make one little correction to your, your picture of the, of the church that there was an earlier break right, in the yeah. church, of course, the between Eastern. the Eastern and, yeah. the, and the Western, which has always been something that the church ached about and wish, which was... But that took a thousand years, too. That took a thousand. You know, for a thousand years, there's the unity, and then there was a, a, the division, and, the, and then later we see the, the division now into, I, I think I read in some book recently, over 20,000. 26,000. 26,000 different groups, new ones starting every five days. Christians. You know. One thing I say is, if, yeah. if, if the church is Christ's bride, then is Christ a polygamist? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All that claim to be the church. <laughs> yeah, really. Let's take our next caller, John from Baltimore. Hello, John. What's your yes. question for us yes, tonight? Yes, Marcus, my question uh, is to uh, Dennis, and it's prompted by the fact that I've gone through the same experience as he has returning to the Catholic Church after having had a positive uh, fundamentals experience uh, in which I, I came to you know, love the Scriptures like I never had before. Uh, like him, I've come to recognize the Church as the uh, pinnacle of truth and the uh, magisterium as the living teaching authority of Christ today. However, that fundamentalist experience you know, also has left me with, and brought with me barriers that I find that hinder me as I come to the church, uh, especially in my devotional life, such as uh, the, uh, uh, the centrality of the Eucharist and the Mass in my life. And also a, a problem is, is that when I come to see you know, the church maybe using uh, the Bible in snippets rather than in the more vital way that I experienced uh, in the fundamentalist uh, uh, background. Thank you, John. You know, that, that actually is a common comment uh, that I've heard from a number of converts uh, because th these voices are there of, of a little bit of uncomfortable with, comfortableness with the way that we do things as Catholics the way we did before as Protestants. Yeah, well, deal with them. You know. <laughs> yeah, no, literally, seriously, deal with them in serious study. I mean, I mean, I'm thankful to uh, to my Protestant background for the, the way it taught me how to study the Bible. What a marvelous! Thi I mean, it's this big, and it's just awesome uh, the, the wisdom that's in there, you know. So, uh, so you know, deal with your um, uh, your questions. I call them whatabouts. Uh, deal with them, and because on the other side of them, you're going to be that much stronger within the church. And, and you don't want to put them off. I, I, in my book I talk about how people have, you know, logic uh, skeletons in, in their, I mean, their, um, skeletons in their logic closet, you know, or they're, you know, it's like you have to pull them out and deal with them because when you do, uh, I mean, uh, from my own experience, when I do those studies, I feel so good at the end of them because I, I now, now I'm not kidding myself anymore in just one little aspect. Otherwise you're kind of, you're not, you're not fully in, in the church. Yeah, and I, again, an encouragement to the, our listener. Uh, we would encourage any Catholic, anyone listening, to study the scriptures as much as possible. I mean, that's the encouragement of the church. But I also encourage you to keep, in the other hand, the catechism, <coughs> so that um, there's an important distinction, which I know has been made in this program before, but I think it's important that, that often, in fundamentalist circles and other circles, the idea in Bible study is, okay, let's go to the Bible to discover what's the truth about baptism, right? Looking at all the verses on baptism, what's the truth about baptism? And as a Catholic, that's not exactly how we understand because the, the whole of God's revelation is in Scripture and in the tradition handed on by the apostles. So we go to Scripture with the teachings of the church on baptism. We understand what the truth is in baptism, and we see it brought out alive in Scripture, how those Scriptures then describe the truth that the church passes on. Let's take our next email. This is from Frank. Gentlemen, I just turned into your program and was interested in the discussion about heavy metal music. I have been sucked into the world of metal and feel there are demons or evil spirits present when I listen. I know that sounds crazy, but I really feel it's true. Is such a thing possible, and how do I get out of this addiction to such music? Thanks for your help. Yeah, well, it's true. It, it, there are demons involved. You know, it's, here's the thing about heavy metal. Um, uh, heavy metal is kind of an anger-based 
thing. It's an energy release, and it encourages, imp it encourages impulsiveness. But impulsiveness doesn't work. It, um, it leads you into, you know, maybe uh, sexual problems or uh, it's not the approach to take. You know, I, I think you could still enjoy kind of the feeling of the music uh, without getting, well, the best way I would say is, is CCM once again. Yeah. As a transition, uh, like DC Talk or, you know. Yeah. Um. But you know, one thing that I've discovered and I've always been in music, and I love music, and I'm an eclectic when it comes to music. I think there's, there's only a few kinds of music that at one point in my life I didn't like. Um, but the, the, there's a power with music, a mystical power of music that touches you deeply. And I think that's why it can be a danger too, because you can be blind to how it is touching you, uh, whether it's sources, whether it's being used as a channel of some sort, not a channel with a capital C, you know, a channel, a spiritual channel, but a channel in the way that it, opening your heart maybe to things you wouldn't normally think about. And so I believe that when we talk about the conversion of the heart, the main ways in which we touch our heart are through our senses and through our thinking. I mean, that's where it gets in there. And we need to be very vigilant of what comes in through our eyes, comes in through our ears, comes in through our touch, because our heart is shaped by all those things that come into it. Yeah, the, the natural uh, uh, approach, the first approach that people would like to take is just to be impulsive. They want to just ride the feeling, ride the yeah. feeling, ride the feeling, and, and the secular world kicks that up because you buy my product, you know, all this. Um, so, so, but, but what uh, church life is and where it's uh, superior to that is it gives you a peace. I mean, peace feels better than riding the impulse, because you can ride the impulse into anything. And especially if you have a bunch of people around you who are doing the same thing. But, but there's, peace is superior, and, and peace has holiness that goes along with it. So that's why we have to guard our actions and stuff. We've got a couple minutes left, and it is getting tight here. But this, this, I have a feeling this email is going to take longer than we have, but let's give a shot at it, all right? It's a good email. Jeff from Tennessee. Hello, Marcus and Dennis. My name is Jeff. I'm not a Catholic. I'm in the Assemblies of God, a Pentecostal Protestant denomination. From time to time, I do tune into the program through satellite just to see what the topic of discussion is. My question to you is, in my church, we believe a person is saved and on their way to heaven at the point when they repent of their sins, believe that Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sin, and ask the Holy Spirit to come into their heart and dwell. Until then, they are a lost soul and on their way to a literal burning hell. In the Catholic Church, how does one know if he's saved or not? Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, there's the simple answer, you know. Uh, you know, you can't lose your salvation. There's, I mean, that's one fallacy of the Protestant. Uh, I mean, Jesus, parable after parable after parable. Right. Uh, to the sheep and the goats right. is the parable you refer to. That's right. right. And there's many of them. Uh, Another one, you know, the people that, just because you say, Lord, Lord. Right, that's right. You know, the, gone, I never knew there's you. all kinds of... And, and there's the danger of a certain avenue of faith that begins with a presupposition and then interprets all of Scripture <coughs> from that presupposition, and then the things that are difficult kind of set aside. But the Catholic Church, on the other hand, believes that our salvation, as we surrender ourselves, just like your email said, if we surrender ourselves to Christ, we repent, we recognize that we're sinners apart from grace, saved by grace, we surrender to Christ, we become children of God, part of the family, saved by His grace, and now expected to act like children of the Father. That picture, that's why I have the picture on the, on the set, is that that's what it means to be saved as a Catholic, is coming home to the Father and receiving His grace. By the way, one thing I did want to say about Protestant Catholic, uh, John 17, 20. Um, you know, we, we're very quick to ask Jesus uh, for things. We, we pray to Jesus, we ask Him for things, and we want our prayers answered by Jesus. Well, Jesus had a prayer in John 17, 20. And his prayer was that all those who would come to believe in him through the teaching of the apostles would be one, as he and the Father are one, that they would find their unity complete. So really, if we, if we want to answer Jesus' prayer, we need to definitely work towards unifying. Towards unity. Yeah. And so that all have the fullness of the truth and the full relationship with Christ, a full personal relationship with Christ through his church and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit which also follows some suffering as, as the old me is replaced by the new me. Dennis, we've run out of time. It is great to have you on the program. Thank you for your Thank witness. You. And I think there's probably a few people out there that said, been there, done that, when they looked at your background. 
and thank God for your own journey of faith to Jesus and his church, and we'll keep all of you in prayer. We need to do that because we walk the journey together, right? It's a journey of prayer together and encouragement. Thank you again for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Let's keep each other in prayer. Pray for the network here, for all the programs, and let's keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. For we walk the journey, it's he that we follow. God bless. <music>